What's the secret sauce to success? I'm Pinchas Taylor, and this is Taylor Talks. Welcome to a very special interview and presentation with our good friend, Sean Kanan, who was once known as Karate's Bad Boy and uh, in Karate Kid Part 3 is also well known uh, from starring in many soap operas and uh, day daytime television. And so welcome, Sean, uh, to the show, and we're happy to have you here. Thank you, Rabbi. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Awesome. So... So we, a lot of us know you and remember you as Karate's bad boy. I know personally I was uh, scared of you. And then when we, when we had met, uh, you said, <laughs> you kind of laughed it off. You said, no, I'm just a regular bar mitzvah bacher. And so, <laughs> so I wanted you to kind of like give us a, a brief background on, on your life, on your growing up, and bring us to the present day before we get into some of the stuff that you're doing today. Sure. Okay. So um, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I left when I was five, um, not by myself. I went with my parents. And uh, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in a, a small town of about 25,000 people called Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Uh, we lived out in the township, but we're about maybe a five minute drive from the Amish Dutch people. So it was not at all unusual to see, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody driving in a horse and buggy. Um, you know, it almost to the point where, you know, you'd look and say, oh, look, there's a horse and buggy, but it was, it was pretty frequent. Um, I was one of probably five Jewish kids uh, when I was going to elementary school and junior high school. Uh, that was tough. Um, I think when I was, when I was younger, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was bullied a lot and um, it, it had a profound effect on me um, in a lot of ways. Uh, as I got older, around 13 years old, I started studying martial arts, and that had, a, again, a very dramatic effect on me. Uh, gave me a lot of self-confidence. It, it showed me that I was good at something, and um, I didn't know it at the time, but it ultimately helped prepare me for the role that would effectively change the trajectory of my career, which was when I was in the Karate Kid 3. Um, went away to uh, uh, boarding school for my uh, junior and senior year. So I had two years of uh, public high school and two years of very shishi sleepaway school. And that was really interesting for me because, you know, sometimes when you're in the middle of an experience like that, you, you don't really, I didn't really realize all of the benefits that it was affording me. Um, you know, I was sent away to boarding school and I had a lot of resentment because I was sent away. Uh, and it was difficult and it was, it was lonely, but in retrospect, I got a very good education, but it also exposed me to a very multinational uh, diversity-based population in the school. I mean, I went to school with kids that were from the ruling families of Kuwait in Saudi Arabia, wealthy Mexican kids, um, inner city kids that were there on scholarship. So it really, um, you know, it, it crossed all social, ethnic, um, all different lines at, at a very young age. I was ex uh, exposed to a lot of very different people that sometimes people don't get exposed to until they get a little older and out into the world. So that was really great. And in addition to that, um, I, I had the chance to go down to Rio de Janeiro when I was 15, and that was a pretty life-changing experience, too. Um, I told my father that I had decided I wanted to go to the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and he said, get your ass back in a plane now. <laughs> he said, you're not going to just beach bum around in uh, Rio. <laughs> I figured <laughs> I floated up the flagpole and see if... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to college in Boston. I went to uh, Boston University, which uh, which was really terrific. Um, you know, I, I look back again and I think of some of the things I wish I had done there. One of which was that Ellie Wiesel was a teacher there, and I I wasn't able to get into his class. But imagine if if I had been able to do that, that would have been pretty wonderful. I did get to study with Howard Zinn, which was interesting. Uh, if, if anyone knows who Howard Zinn is, uh, he wrote this really interesting book called uh, A People's History of the United States. Um, very interesting, different take on a lot of 
the history that we take for granted. Um, I realized I wanted to be an actor, and if I was going to do it, I needed to either go to New York or Los Angeles. Uh, like I joked with you on the phone, I figured it was easier to, to be broke where the, the sun was out. So I moved to Los Angeles in 1987. I enrolled uh, at UCLA and ultimately finished my political science degree there while simultaneously beginning my acting career. Um, and uh, and that's, that, that pretty much is how that all started. Okay, cool. And so move us, move us from uh, Karate Kid Part 3, where you are bad boy, karate's bad boy, uh, to, to some of the work that you're doing today. Because uh, I, I find the idea for the book that you wrote, The Success Factor, uh, to be very intriguing to, to explore from mo many of the most successful people that, that are alive today and, and really get to the, to the essence of where their success lies. Uh, and you've explored it, that there's sort of like a special sauce. What was the inspiration to write this book? And uh, what were some of your discoveries that you found in speaking to these people? So this is the book. I'll hold it up with a gratuitous plug. It's called Success Factor X. And uh, about 15 years ago, I had been asked to be in a book called American Pride, which was compiled by a woman named Jill Lieberman, who actually probably doesn't live that far from you in, in Florida. Um, it was really a book that had a lot of uh, uh, really kind of incredible people in it, and they were all giving their thoughts about you know, what it is for them to be an American. And she graciously asked me to be a part of it. So Jill called me years later, like 14, 15 years later, I hadn't spoken to her in a really long time. She just ostensibly called me to wish me a happy birthday. And we got into this long conversation and I pitched her this idea uh, for what later became Success Factor X. And what we did was we went out to 50 uh, outstanding individuals in all different fields and we said, would you please write us an organic submission about what success means to you? What advice do you have about success? And uh, we got just an incredible response. Um, people like Mark Cuban, uh, Anthony Robbins, um, Daryl McDaniels, the founding member of Run DMC, uh, gold medal athletes, baseball players, football players, business titans, just a really interesting um group of people that well on the surface they all share success as a common denominator none of these people to an individual describes their success in monetary terms in terms of kind of what they've accomplished and what they've done what's really interesting is again almost to an individual they describe it in terms of their ability to help others to you know, lead their best life. Um, I'm a firm believer that everybody, all of us, no matter who you are, has a masterpiece within yourself. And that masterpiece is effectively um, your most authentic life. And in living that life, you're gonna share a gift with the rest of the world. And for me, that's really what it's about. Um, you know, for me, it's my, my acting, my writing. For you, Rabbi, it's, you know, your belief in God, probably in the way that you are able to transmit that to your congregation and help them achieve the best lives they want to, I'm just guessing. But everybody has something. And, you know, for those of us that were able to discover it at a young age, that's really a gift because a lot of people, it takes them a while to figure it out. Um, but it's one of those books where you can pick it up, you can open it up to anywhere in the book. You don't have to read it chronologically. And depending on where you are at that moment in your life, the words that you're going to receive from the book are going to hit you differently than they may have a week ago. And so it's one of those, you know, almost like a, a resource material you can go back to um, again and again. We were really honored that Book Authority named Success Factor X one of the 20 most um, uh, influential uh, books um, in the last 20 years for inspiration, inspiration-based books. So that was really nice. Uh, cool. It became on uh, uh, 10 days after uh... very nice no, that, that's that's really cool so after talking to 
all of these people, you, you mentioned Mark Cuban and, and, a, and a whole slew of other people that are successful in many areas of their, of their own careers and their own uh, life and their own, making, like, as you said, the, making the best version of themselves. So right. what, what would you call the secret sauce after all that exploration, after writing the book and putting <laughs> pens to paper, what would you say would be the, the secret sauce in, in having a person transform themselves to who they could be potentially into actualizing their uh, success factor? I don't think it's one thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple ideas, and they may not be completely linear. I, I, I tend not to think in a linear way, but I'm a firm believer that mostly there are two things that – affect change in people. And those two things are love and fear. Um, and, and fear can be a lot of different things. Um, you know, fear can be, you know, uh, my father was an alcoholic and was terrible to my mother and I'm afraid that I'll become that guy. So I'm gonna do everything in my life to not be that guy. Uh, or it can be, we never had enough to eat as a kid in, in Tony Robbins case. Uh, he was afraid that, uh, you know, that he had lived in poverty and knew what that was like and saw the pressure it put on his, his mother and he was determined that that was not going to be his reality. So that sort of fear. You know, for, for a lot of people, it's also uh, uh, love. Um, I, I think also it's uh, an unfailing belief in yourself, even when others don't. I think that's important. Um, I think it's really important to be willing to give and help other people without any anticipation of something coming back to you. Um, I think it's having the guts to know when to kind of buck the norm and, you know, take the road less traveled. Okay. Uh, you know, and I, and I, and I guess, I guess also I think it's having a, deep-seated belief, in my case at least, that, that I'm here for a reason. There's a purpose for my being here. And I hope that my interpretation of what that is, that is, is in line with, with God's and, and that I'm able to best transmit that to the people that, you know, I come in contact with. Uh, and, and also realizing that I make tremendous mistakes pretty much on a daily basis. And, you know, you got to pick yourself up. And, and dust yourself off and keep going. And, um, you know, we, we have a, you know, my, my martial arts teacher used to have a, a, a saying, and he'd say, you know, get knocked down seven times, get up eight. And you have to realize that um, the, the, the path to success is very rarely uh, a, a, a direct vertical ascension. You know, there's, there's generally lots of setbacks, lots of failures, and, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if, if handled properly, the, the failures are, you know, every bit as important as the successes. Um, you know, and I, I'd say my last thing is I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a big proponent to, to quote to a martial artist and a boxer. You know, Mike Tyson used to always say, everybody's got a plan or they get punched in the face. And, you know, the, what I take from that is what Bruce Lee said, which is like, be like water. You know, water can be hard like ice or it can go through the flow. And, and you have to learn to kind of be flexible and malleable and understand that, you know, life throws curveballs at you and you got to be able to ad adapt and overcome. So those are, those, are my, those are my tips for success. Oh, one last one. I'm sorry, I never talked a bunch, but my grandfather used to always say this and it's true, I believe. He said, advice is free listen to it. You don't have to take it. You don't have to agree with it. And, and, you know, sometimes when somebody gives you advice, it's not the advice itself that's important in the sense that it's going to help you, but it tells you something about that. You know, you learn something, you learn something about that person, whether it be something positive or negative. So he used to always say to me, you know, when you're able, learn to shut up and just listen sometimes. Okay, no, I, I, I like a lot of those conclusions. It's, it sounds, from what, I'm, from what I'm understanding, it sounds like the, the secret sauce is basically getting the focus off of yourself and being mission-focused. You know, the, 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 the things that you mentioned about being, the, they define success as being able to 
uh, help others and give back and, and not only give back, but be able to do so in a way that they didn't ever expect it to have anything in return. It's to listen to mentors and to advice, again, because it's not about me and me being right and me being the ones to make the uh, decisions and, and whatnot. It's, it's, it's about the mission and, and any source that is going to help me to facilitate that mission is, is worthwhile and listening. So it, it sounds that the more we focus on, on the me, the, the shakier the success is, but when it's, when it's mission driven, when it's about uh, what my role is in the world, you had mentioned that, that you hope that the way that you're defining your purpose in life is in line with what God had uh, sort of uh, envisioned for you. And I, I think as, as, as long as a person is focused on the mission, then, then that will be uh, productive in them achieving their own, their own uh, version of success. Again, each person's success is defined differently because we're all different people. And one of the things, one of the, one of the things that, that, I, that, I, that I find really interesting is that there, there, there are a few ways that Jewish tradition teaches that a person uh, maximizes, I want to say the success, but gets in touch with their purpose. How do you find your individual purpose? We all have a collective purpose. And that, that collective purpose is to uh, bring godliness into the world, meaning to, to light up the world, to uh, that wherever you go, it should be imbued with a, a, a godly spirit, a good spirit, uh, that, that, uh, the, that each person personalizes that and implements that in a very different way. Some people do it through singing, some through writing, some through teachings. There's, there's really an infinite amount of ways that you personally can do that. So some of the ways that, the, the first ways that, that Torah tradition teaches is that you got to look at your passions and you got to mm -hmm. look at your talents. Where mm -hmm. are you passionate in your, in your own life? What, why would you wake up in the morning and what gets you going? Or are you, what are your talents? What are your unique past experiences that have shaped you and given you sort of an edge over others. Right. And the last one would be what situation do you currently find yourself in? There, it's not by happenstance that a person finds themselves living in the city that they're living in, born to the family that they were born to, uh, in the time in which they were born to. Everything was given to you with a reason, with a purpose. And if you hone in on those particular aspects for your personal mission, you'll be able to fill, fulfill in your, in your personal way the divine mission, the overall divine mission of uh, making the world into a godly place. So I, I wonder, in your life and in all, in all of these people uh, that, that, uh, that we've spoken about and that we talked about on the phone um, the other day, there, there are so many ways in which success can be defined in a person's life. A person can be very successful in one aspect of their life and extremely unsuccessful in another aspect of their life. They can be very successful financially, not so successful health-wise, not so successful emotionally. Uh, there's an there's, there's, there's infinite amount of combinations that you can define someone as successful and equally as not successful. So I want to know, uh, if, if, you are, if you're willing to share, where are the areas in your life that you find that you are really maximizing success? Where are the areas that you are still working on it? It's still a it's still a step-by-step -step process that there's still room for, for development. And um, and how and what, what steps you're planning on taking in order to take the next step to achieve that personal success. Well, let me preface it by saying that you, you make an excellent point. You know, we live in a society, especially the younger generation, where through television and social media and everything, I think sometimes kids get a very jaundiced perception of what success is. You know, they see, you know, people like, and I'm not picking on the Kardashians, but you see the conspicuous consumption of everything that you know, a lot of the people in the media have, and the feeling is that if you don't have all of that somehow, you're not successful. And I think that's ridiculous, and I think it's a bad message. Um, and it's nothing against the Kardashians. It's just, it's just I'm picking on them because they're, you know, uh, they're out there. Um, you know, for, for example, 
I don't think a lot of people would put at the top of their list somebody who is a janitor is being successful. But what if that same janitor worked overtime and saved as much money as he could and put his daughter through medical school? I'd say that's a pretty successful guy. I'd say that would be um, you know, held up as an example uh, for a lot of what he must have had to go through to do that. So I, I think success comes in different forms. Um, what are the things that I need to work on? Let's take those first. Um, I think probably uh, definitely being a better listener, listening more, speaking less is something that uh, I, I try to work on. Um, I, I think as an actor, I, I'm in a lot of ways more of an emotionally based, less analytical type person. Uh, I think a lot of people that sort of gravitate toward, towards the arts are that way. Uh, one of the consequences of that, at least for me, is I, uh, you know, I sometimes have to, you know, struggle to keep my emotions in check. Um, uh, I have to really force myself to be disciplined about certain things uh, that, that might not be so hard for other people. Um, you know, whether something as silly as, you know, not running to the refrigerator at one o'clock if something sounds good, as opposed to really being hungry uh, and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think those are some of the things that I really need to work on. Things that I've gotten better with as I've gotten older is I, I you know, hopefully learned to be a more compassionate, authentic and connected person both with myself and with the people that I love. Um, uh, you know, people have different things, Rabbi. I mean, you know, some people have different, uh, have a difficult time being demonstrative about showing their love to other people. You know, for me, that's not something that's difficult. Uh, other people have difficulty kind of, you know, staying on task and focused for one reason or another. They become easily just, you know, we all, everybody has something. I, I heard this, I heard this quote the other day, I think it was, I was watching a TV show and somebody famous said it, I don't remember who, but he said, everybody lives in a house on fire. And, and by that, they mean everybody's got their shit, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> and, and mine might come in a different, you know, look different than yours, but I guarantee you got your stuff, I got mine. And I think the key is that if you're able to identify it and if you're able to just keep working towards making it better and realizing as it is with so many things, life's a process, you know? You, 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 we need to hold ourselves accountable, but also realize that we are human, we will fail, we will make mistakes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an overly religious person, but I, I do start my, my morning almost every single day on my knees praying, you know, praying to be a better person, uh, praying that, you know, God will take my character defects away from me and instead replace it with faith in he, she, or it. And, uh, you know, that I can, I can humbly walk the path that God has put before me, you know, seeking my highest self, being of service, uh, doing for others while attracting health, wealth, love, and, and prosperity and helping those that I love and praying that no, no, no badness comes to them. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of my spiel about what gets my day started. And it, it, it at least, it at least gets my mind thinking the right way for that moment, you know? So I hear no, th those are, those are definitely good ways to start your day. And, and the truth of the matter is the bridge between your own personal life mission with the collective world life mission begins with recognizing God's role uh, in that both on a personal level and on a global level. And the, the, sometimes just the, the translation of bringing the personal level to the global level is, is where the, uh, where some of the confusion lies. So, so what it sounds like is that you're off to a really good start, uh, particularly in, in your in your spiritual life. But perhaps um, perhaps a little uh, further discussion uh, with, with maybe with a rabbi, maybe maybe studying with a rabbi, maybe over Zoom in a private meeting that's not recorded uh, would be something beneficial to increase. Uh, this the success the success factor in the, in the spiritual realm for Sean, um, and then um, helping that go from a personal level to a communal and global level 
um, as well. Well, you know, I, I, believe, I believe people enter into other people's lives for reasons. Uh, and, and I think uh, it, it's very serendipitous uh, how you came into mine and hopefully how I came into yours. So I would welcome that. I think that would be wonderful. Awesome. So um, I, look forward, I look forward to reading The Success Factor. I look forward to uh, <laughs> making myself much more of a success in, in uh, a lot of areas in my life. And um, I, I really thank and appreciate the fact that you took some time to come out and talk with us today and sharing what you learned about success from some of the most successful people on planet Earth. Uh, I look forward to continuing studying with you and continuing um, our uh, you know, sessions together. And, um, and uh, my pleasure, honor to speak with you and to uh, you know, speak to your uh, people that watch your podcast, your congregation, anyone. Uh, Thank you. I hope people will check the book out. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, and there's just some good stuff in there that I, that I, hope, I hope feeds and nourishes. And I think this is a, a time when we could all use something like that. Absolutely. We can all, it's always a time for success, but when you're quarantined and you're, uh, you're being held down and, and whatnot, all the more so everyone's ready to burst out and, uh, and go accomplish something new. So thanks so much, Sean, for being here. Thank and, you, Brad. Um, and we'll see everybody soon. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.